Market signals Republican sweep as Biden commits to second debate. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Ainsley Insights, brought to you by Ainsley Bullion, Ainsley Crypto, and the Gold and Silver Standard, as the Ainsley Group celebrates 50 years. Today, we welcome back Sam, who's been spending some time thinking about that debate we've all been talking about since Friday. What an interesting time in history. How are you going today, Sam? Good, Chris. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Now, I'm sure, like everyone, you've not been able to stop talking about that debate. It was certainly fascinating. What was your take on it? It's certainly been dominating the news feeds and also the social media feeds of late. Yeah, well, this is the time of, you know, this the four-year period where financial news starts to get dominated by the, you know, U.S. politics. So it's going to be really, really hard for us to avoid uh, Trump, Biden, or whoever else comes into the field. You know, we have vice president nominees who will be popping up. Um, but look, it was it was a shaky uh, performance, to say the least. Um, it, I mean, on the... Uh, to, to criticize both of them, they were arguing about their golf game, which was uh, pretty, pretty <laughs> Very childlike, which, yep. yeah, which they both um, admitted. This debate wasn't as bad as the last one where there was, you know, attacks on each other's family, you know, where's Hunter and this sort of things. But it was really clear that Biden was just not the same person he was uh, years ago. Hmm. So there was a, a pretty clear panic from the the Democrat Party uh, about the performance, and then uh, what what's happened, you know, as as far as financial news goes, is the you know the markets were kind of waiting to digest post debate what the reaction was going to be because during the debate the markets moved a little bit, but they kind of just went back to where they were um, af- by the end of the debate. Now after the debate, it came out that Biden has no plans to withdraw. Uh, apparently he thinks he did all right, and he's going to debate again in September, or at least he wants to. Now, coming off the back of of that news, that gave uh, the markets indication that there would be uh, a Republican victory, uh, and- because you know with that week of a performance, it and you know wanting to keep going. It would essentially have to be his party pulling the rug out from under him and putting someone else in in place or him becoming uh, a much different person in the next debate. And, and that's what I really find fascinating about this whole situation because we saw the betting markets, right? Like we were watching that at the time and it just, they took off during the debate that it was sort of even, even to clearly one side um, towards Trump during that debate because people going, okay, it, it looks like it's a one-way situation. It seems crazy to me that everyone doesn't see that. I mean, that was objective. I know, I know that's still just just betting markets. It doesn't it doesn't yeah. mean who's going to win, but it's still objective data that you've got that it wasn't going well. You, you specifically mentioned this idea of a Republican sweep being on the table. Can you maybe just talk to us a little bit more about that? Because I don't fully understand the mechanics of, of how that works because they have sort of the midterm situation where, you know, you lose half and um, of the people in the Senate or however that works there. What, yeah. what is, what, what, are, what is the market effectively telling us that they're concerned about based on, on those betting markets really taking off how they did and that concept of a, a sweep for the Republicans? So firstly, um, you know, a president can go into power, but everyone else in the government can be, essentially against the president. So that that can happen sometimes. Um, So there are different parts of the government in the United States. That's why before when the news came out that, you know, the House uh, was was voting on a draft bill. I mean, that's just the House. It's not the Senate, um, you know, and things still have have a chance to be vetoed by the president. So in this case, though, it looks like the markets are anticipating a clean sweep. So it looks like a potential Republican House, Republican Senate, and Republican White House. What that means and why that would affect the market is because based on what they're saying, at least, and based on, you know, a previous Trump presidency, it's going to look like a really pro-stock market administration. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of the battle of being president and going out and making a speech and saying, I want to do this, I want to do that, and I'm going to make it happen. A lot of that can be unrealistic sometimes because the way the government's set up in D.C. is 
you can't just get elected and be king and do whatever you want. <laughs> the president can come out and say, I'm going to do all sorts of things. But unless uh, the rest of the government agrees, they're essentially gridlocked, more or less. So in this situation, if uh, Trump gets the presidency and his party pretty much runs the whole government, if he says, I want to do this, I want to do that, it will be pretty much a, a sweeping decision that, that could just roll through the rest of the government unless they start to have some sort of uh, inner warfare, which kind of seems less likely after the, the last um, election because it was a loss. Hmm. And I, I think you can imagine the positive of that because you've got if it's all, you know, things are passing, you don't have that gridlock, which let's face it, the US has been notorious for for the last long period of time now where they have consistently had gridlock, things haven't been able to get through. We've had those government shutdowns, all those issues that theoretically don't exist when you have that clean sweep to one side or the other. But the flip side of that, of course, is that you also don't have those necessarily checks and balances in place. Something that's potentially a big concern for us here in Australia when we think about what the impacts are going to be for us of uh, another Trump presidency, do we end up back in a US-China trade war situation, for example? Does this affect our ability in Australia to manage our trade relationships? What's your take on the broader impact for us here at home if it goes the way that it currently looks like it could be going? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, some people say we're not in a trade war anymore you know, the US and China, but it's pretty clear that US and China are in a trade war and have been in a trade war since Trump's presidency. Now, what Trump did was very loud, very vocal, um, uh, included, you know, some, some of his uh, or one of his old tweets in my news article today, hmm. but he made it very apparent what he was doing and that shocked markets. What Biden has done has been a little bit quieter and it's been a more surgical attack on, you know, things like chips, you know, things that could be used for, for AI. Um, yeah. So it, it's been a very surgical kind of intellectual property sort of attack rather than just um, going after swaths of goods and trying to reorganize, you know, huge supply chains. But uh, that does leave Australia in a tricky spot. Now, one of the reasons is um, China's made it clear during Trump's last presidency that they're willing to retaliate and go after American allies. And that means Australia, we had our agricultural industry targeted, we had wine uh, targeted. They tried to stop taking iron ore, including, you know, the, uh, and coal as well, including one shipment that was had already arrived to dock in China, and they simply didn't let it dock. So they had to come all the way back and they didn't understand why. It was just a way of protesting. So um, they're willing to, to do these actions on Australia, although it's going to be really hard to stop taking Australian iron ore because uh, who else, you know, who else is going to provide that amount of, of iron ore? It's, it's just not really feasible. As far as other goods, though, we could get hit in the agricultural sector. Um, and then secondly, our currency. I think our currency and stock market could could take a big hit, and that I suppose is always the issue with globalization. the 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 benefit of globalization is everyone specializes. So when you use that iron ore example, you mm -hmm. go, well, that is an area that we have a competitive advantage. So it makes mm -hmm. sense that we would be producing that, and that other countries would want to buy it. When we talk about particularly Trump's policies suggesting tariffs on things, we we could be entering a, a brand new world around this. You specifically talk about the potentially needing to reorganize exports about what, how we focus as a country. Do you think that that's actually a viable solution for Australia? Do you think that you know, if we start to see global supply chains changing, how it all flows, how it all fits together, starting to change, do we have a place where we can be a little bit proactive there potentially and, and take advantage? Or do we just sort of get steamrolled by the bigger players like China and the US in this situation? How do you sort of see that angle of it? I guess the good thing is it does have to start with us and it ends with the consumer. So if the United States really realistically wants to get products that are not from China, that are made in places like Vietnam, Thailand, India, you know, a lot of industries have been moving over to India in, in the recent couple of years, um, just from, you know, what, what Trump did earlier. Um, 
to actually move to these places and start producing products, they're going to need the natural resources first. So we should be at the beginning of the uh, production line where these other countries start to order from us, which would be a good thing for Australia. And then eventually the consumers initially in the United States will be the ones that um, bear the brunt of this because they'll be paying more and waiting a longer time for this reshuffling to happen. And that's a really interesting point I hadn't really thought about. It's unlikely, or you would imagine it relatively unlikely, that the tariffs, when they come, are focused on the start of the chain, as you've just described. Like, it doesn't make sense that you would be putting big tariffs on industries that you don't particularly have at home. You would be doing it on those final goods. So from that perspective, we could actually be in a really good spot. Yeah, so Australia might not be damaged too much from this. I think the thing Australians have to look out for is uh, with the Trump presidency, he rules by Twitter or what's now X. So dramatically coming out and saying, surprise, surprise, happy Monday morning. I'm going to add all these tariffs on China. And you could see like last time he announced uh, some tariffs, um, which I added a tweet for in the article. Following that tweet, the Australian stock market dropped over 5% in about two days. So these huge booms and busts happening in markets, people need to be a little bit careful, I think, with a with the Trump presidency. So we, we might have um, passed the time of these stable days we've had of late where it's relatively smooth sailing, slowly up, slowly down, but but nothing major. We could be back for some of that real volatility that we saw last time. Could well, just look, for, for traders and investors, it's a dream come true. But for those looking for stability, it can be really scary. White knuckle ride. Very interesting. Well, we'll stay tuned. On that next debate still a while away and a lot can happen in the meantime. So who knows what, we, what we'll actually see by the time that comes. But fascinating discussion. Thank you for your work on that today, Sam. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone, for watching. We'll chat again soon.